um, we're going to talk about internal grounding um, in pink lady apples and particularly um, sort of what we need to know coming into the, the current season with harvest sort of not too far around the corner. So um, the sort of reason we wanted to, to get together today and, and talk about internal grounding was um, there's been quite a lot of discussion, quite a lot of interest um, in internal browning because in the last year, so the 2021 harvest in Australia, um, there seemed to be a fair amount of internal browning showing up and it, it wasn't sort of in one location. It seemed to be pretty persistent around the different um, growing regions in Australia last year. Um, so knowing that that's what happened last year, we thought this was a good opportunity to sort of get together, talk about internal browning disorders in general. Um, their causes, how we can best manage them, and both in the orchard and from the, the post-harvest side of things. Um, so I'm going to start fairly basic and we're going to talk a little bit about disorders in general. Um, and then we're going to get more specific about pink ladies and then more specific about this current season. So in terms of post-harvest disorders, I think, again, starting sort of at the basics, one of the um, most sort of fundamental things to understand is that disorders are not diseases. So there's no pathogens involved here. Um, we're talking about the, the fruit itself. Um, disorders can be caused by a range of pre and post harvest conditions. Um, for the most part, we are talking about a combination of pre and post harvest conditions that result in internal browning. And because we have that um, mix of combination of um, pre and post harvest, we often need to talk about a holistic approach. So we want to understand what we can do in the orchard, um, as well as what we can do on the storage side when we're talking about both the diagnosis of a disorder um, and the management of a disorder. So disorders can result in either external or internal um, injury or both. And internal browning, which is what we're, we're here to talk about today, um, is a, current, a common symptom of apple physiological disorders. So, a good place again to start is what is internal browning? So internal browning um, results from the oxidation of cellular contents by um, polyphenol oxidase. So we have the phenolic compounds in the cell. Those get oxidized into a mid-step, which are called quinones. Those get further oxidized and we end up with these compounds that have the brown discoloration. So for these two oxidation steps to happen, um, we need to have had the cell rupture because these phenolic compounds are all inside of the plant cells. So for them to get oxidized, we need to have that cell break for some reason. So this is the, the same reaction that happens for all internal browning disorders in all apples. So why we have different disorders or different causes or different management strategies is we're all trying to manage um, what it was that caused this cell damage in the first place. Um, because once that damage occurs, that's where we have this reaction that um, happens in the fruit and we end up with the, the brown discoloration. So all apples can brown. Um, there's only the Arctic apple, which has been genetically modified not to brown, um, that won't brown. But any other apple, if you put it in the right or wrong, um, storage conditions, um, you can get this reaction and get brown discoloration. So there's common presentations of internal browning in apples. The three um, main features of, that will result in internal browning are those that are related to maturity, um, those that are related to temperature, um, those that are related to the storage atmosphere, and then we have this kind of basket of other disorders. So they might have factors of, of one or all of these that are involved, but they're sort of a little bit peculiar or a bit specific um, and they fall into this, this other basket. Um, so today we're gonna to talk about um, each one of these factors, uh, how they're involved and how we can identify them. And then we'll talk more specifically about the pink lady side of thing once we sort of understand these different disorders um, and how they fit together. So our maturity and senescent related internal browning disorders. So the first thing that we talk about with disorders is their appearance so that we can try and identify which disorder we might be looking at when we're looking at an apple with internal browning. So one of the key indicators for, for this type of in, internal browning is that we have this diffuse margin. So what I'm talking about there is we have um, a brown affected tissue here um, and then it sort of fades into unaffected tissue here. It's not what I, um, call a distinct margin where you have that really harsh line between the unaffected and the affected um, area of the fruit. So with these disorders, we have this fading of the severity. Um, the other point to keep in mind is that with um, maturity or senescent related internal brownings, this damaged area 
is often fairly soft or mealy. So if you sort of push on that with your um, hand, you can push um, the cells apart and you have that sort of soft mealy texture. Uh, causes of this type of disorder. So it is an age or senescent maturity related disorder. So it's senescent breakdown of cells. That's the physiology of sort of what's happening within that fruit that's causing that breakdown of cells that then relates to the, the oxidation. So with these types of um, disorders, it's all those things that are associated with age. So it could be that you had optimal um, maturity fruit, but they've just been stored for a really long time. So they've aged in the post-harvest environment. Um, it could be storage under not optimal conditions. So maybe the fruit's been stored fairly warm or it's been stored under air storage as opposed to controlled atmosphere storage. So all those things would keep that fruit more active and it's going to be aging um, a little bit faster than under our more optimal long-term storage conditions. And so because of that, we'll see some of these types of disorders. Again, the other side where we see age-related or senescent-related disorders is going to be related to our harvest maturity. So the more mature that fruit is when we harvest it, the more likely we are to start seeing these disorders um, show up in storage. And then one of the things that we'll see as a, um, a familiar thread as we go through this is that a lot of these can add together or sort of cascade together. So if you had late maturity fruit that was stored under non-optimal conditions and then stored for a long time, that's sort of your worst case scenario. You're adding all those factors together, um, which would then increase your risk for seeing this type of disorder in storage. So because this is really about um, maturity management, this is a, a type of browning that you can really see in all apples. Um, obviously those that are more difficult to manage maturity are gonna be ones that you have a higher susceptibility in. Um, management for this type of disorders is all about managing that maturity um, and managing your storage um, to really keep that fruit in the optimal condition for as long as possible and about management of your inventory. So if you know that you have fruit that's a little bit over mature, um, it's managing that inventory so that those aren't the fruit that are held for long-term storage. So if we move then into a chilling injury related um, internal browning. So here's that contrast um, where here we have a defined margin between the damaged and the undamaged areas. So we really go from um, some quite severe internal browning here, but there's a really um, harsh line between the brown and the, the undamaged tissue, as opposed to that previous one where we had that real fade um, in severity. So that's one of the, the good telltale signs for chilling injury. Um, is we get this um, defined edge. One of the other good ways to tell chilling injury is I call it a, a donut expression. So you see that it's, it's fairly circular, but you have an, an area of undamaged skin or undamaged flesh between the skin and the damaged area. And then you also have this area of undamaged flesh around the core. So it is this donut sort of shape. So if we go back a slide, um, you'll see that this senescent disorder goes right up um, to the edge of the skin. Uh, the chilling injury is where we have this donut um, expression of the browning. So in terms of a cause of, of what's happening that ends up with this type of browning, it's storage below a threshold temperature. Now we can't really give you a specific temperature of what that is because it's going to depend on the variety of the fruit. Different varieties have different thresholds of where they like to sit, which is why we have different recommendations for different apple varieties of what their minimum storage temperature would be. Um, but when we store fruit below that threshold temperature, we damage cell membranes that ends up breaking the cells and we end up with that browning reaction that happens and causes that internal browning. One of the other things to keep in mind, and, and this is going to be the case with the, the next disorder we'll talk about as well, is that with chilling injury related disorders, it is this combination of time and temperature. So fruit can be exposed to a cool temperature for a short amount of time. And they'll sort of have the ability to recover from that stress if the temperature is brought back to where they, they like to be. But if the fruit is kept down there for uh, a longer period of time, then it doesn't have the ability to recover from that stress. Um, equally, you could be just under the threshold, so not a severe stress, but if you stay there for a long time, you can cause that same type of damage. So it is this combination of the amount of time or the duration that they're kept at a temperature that's below their, their threshold. 
Um, not all varieties are, are particularly susceptible to chilling injury, but a lot of the um, more modern varieties do tend to be because they have a parent that has um, a chilling injury susceptibility. Um, so pink ladies that we're going to be talking about today, um, these are susceptible to chilling injury. Um, and that's uh, why we go through some of the stepwise cooling and procedures that we do that, that we're going to talk about. So for managing chilling injury susceptible varieties, it's about all how we manage that cooling after the fruit is harvested. There's not really much we can do on the, the field side for this. It's about managing once that fruit's been harvested and goes into a full stock is how we expose that fruit to temperature. So we can stepwise cool. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more as well. So that's just slowing down our rate of cooling rather than rapid cooling the fruit down to our final storage temperature. We're gonna load the room a little bit warmer and then slowly bring that temperature down over a period of, of weeks or months um, to get to our final destination temperature. The other piece with a chilling sensitive variety is what that final destination temperature is. Um, so with our more severely chilling sensitive varieties, we wanna be above two degrees Celsius. Um, and then again, this all comes down to variety and, and experience of knowing what that final destination temperature would be um, to try and avoid the development of, of this type of disorder. So the third main type of, of storage disorder that results in internal browning is those that are related to the storage atmosphere. So again, here we have quite a defined area of, of browning between the damaged um, part of the fruit and the undamaged. But the real characteristic when we're talking about CO2 injury um, is we get what's called these lens shaped pits or cavities. So we get these um, holes in the flesh that are usually um, in the same orientation as the vascular tissue. So you can see that um, the CO2 is accumulating in these really tight cells um, along the vascular tissue. And that's where the damage is caused. So they're usually in these nice patterns um, that come across the star shape of the, the vascular tissue. So similar to the chilling injury, um, damage here is usually pretty firm. We're not seeing that soft or mealy texture like we do with the senescent related disorders. Um, so with CO2 related disorders, it's usually, um, again, going to be exposing that piece of fruit to um, an atmosphere where the CO2 level is above the threshold um, that results in damage to the cell walls. So similar to our temperature story, um, this threshold is going to be really dependent on the variety as well as some of the experience or stress that that fruit's been under. Uh, like chilling injury, CO2 is a combination of time and concentration. So we can have spikes of high CO2 and we do very commonly see spikes of high CO2 um, during our um, storage of fruit, particularly at, when we're loading rooms or um, in that first sort of week or two weeks of, of fruit storage when fruit respiration is high. Um, we will see spikes in, in CO2 in the storage room. But if those are relatively short, then we don't expect to see damage that um, comes down later in the, the storage life of that fruit. It's where we have long-term exposure to high levels of CO2. The other thing to keep in mind with CO2 damage is it is very influenced by the level of oxygen. So the lower our oxygen level is, the more risk we have with CO2 exposures. If our oxygen is quite high, so when we're in sort of air storage environments, but we have those fluctuations in CO2, we tend not to see issues, but it's when our oxygen starts to come down where we're going into CA storage or ultra low oxygen um, or other types of low oxygen storage that we then need to be very critical of how we're monitoring our, our CO2 levels. Um, the other thing with CO2 is the, the risk period um, is really that first sort of six to eight weeks out after harvest. We're not going to see the damage then. We're going to see that disorder show up after about four or five months of storage. But it's the, suscept the susceptibility to developing that injury is really that first six to eight weeks. That's when we need to be really critical um, of how we're managing CO2. Um, and again, using oxygen during that time um, is a really good way to, to make sure that we're, we're not getting into damaging um, CO2 levels. Uh, similar to chilling injury, not all varieties are particularly susceptible to CO2, but um, pink lady that we're talking about here today um, is not only susceptible to chilling injury, but also susceptible to CO2 injury. So those are our big three. Um, so maturity, 
chilling injury and CO2 injury are a big three that explain most of the internal browning disorders that we see in apples. Um, then we have this sort of basket of, of all these other um, disorders that sort of don't nicely or neatly fit into one of those categories. So some of these are specific varieties. So Braybone Browning Disorder, yes, it's very influenced by CO2. Yes, it's very influenced by some other things that we know, but it's not doesn't sort of neatly fit as exactly that kind of disorder. So it gets to be its own disorder. Pink Lady, Envy, um, these are other varieties that they sort of fit some of those classifications, but they end up getting their own name. Uh, nutrient deficiency, um, this is one we're gonna talk about a little bit more uh, later on as well. Um, can definitely relate to internal browning. We can get browning. So in this case, this is water core breakdown. So you can be predisposed by another disorder. So there may have been another disorder present either at harvest or during storage. Um, that disorder may have cleared, but then that's been enough to initiate an internal browning disorder later on in storage. Um, where this gets particularly um, complicated and some of what we'll talk about today is a lot of disorders are a combination of factors. Unfortunately, most things when we're talking about fruit and physiology don't fit into nice clean boxes. So we end up having this combination of a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B and multiplied by a little bit of column X um, is what sort of results in our disorder. And then we have all these disorders that we just don't really even know um, what causes them. So that's why we, we keep working and we keep studying internal browning. So that brings us to pink lady internal browning. So now we've had this sort of background on the different disorders, what causes them, what sort of things are involved. Now we can talk more specifically about pink lady. And one of the reasons that, that pink lady browning is particularly interesting and particularly confusing is it's not a single disorder. So this is what makes it a little bit complex. We have three different disorders. So we have the, a type that's generally called um, diffuse. We have another type that's generally called radial. And then we have a third type, which is just straight out CO2 injury. But the challenge is we can confuse these for each other. These are some really nice, clear pictures. It doesn't always look as nice and clear as this. So we can get these three different disorders and we can confuse them for each other. So if we're not sure which disorder we're looking at, then it can make a challenge for us not only to diagnose the disorder, but to try and implement management strategies around that disorder. Because if we don't know what we're looking at, it can be hard to then try and manage it. So the other thing that we're gonna talk about here is that pre and post harvest factors are both really important. The way I like to think about it is that your pre harvest factors, um, they sort of establish your risk category. So are we talking sort of low, medium or high? Um, as a general risk of my fruit for this season, because our risk changes every year, as I'm sure everyone um, is aware and experiences with this nice roller coaster of um, internal disorders that we get from year to year. So pre harvest factors sort of put us in a ballpark, and then post harvest factors manage that risk to be either the minimum or maximum of that risk. So, say we had sort of a mono moderate risk coming out of the orchard. Now it's up to my post-harvest management to try and manage that to be its lowest possible moderate risk. Or if it's mismanaged, I could end up at the highest possible end of that moderate risk of developing internal browning. Sorry, I'm trying to keep an eye on time, um, but I know um, we've got a, a bit to cover. So the next part is that um, all these relationships can be complicated. So pre-harvest factors um, and post-harvest factors are involved in pink lady internal browning. Um, if we talk about some of those pre-harvest factors, fruit maturity is definitely um, a piece of this. So we know that that radial type is very influenced by that senescent type internal browning. So managing fruit maturity is very important. Climate is a piece of this, and we're gonna start talking about that in the, the next slide. Nutrition and crop load, um, also very important and very interlinked together. So low cropping trees tend to have higher incidence of browning. Um, calcium is going to be our most important element here and low cropping trees also tend to have low calcium. So managing crop load and managing nutrition, a lot of it is um, involved in managing our calcium levels. The reason for that is that calcium is involved in cell wall strength. So if we can keep our apple cell walls nice and strong, 
um, both in pre-harvest and post-harvest environment, we're going to be less likely to have those cell walls break down and then less likely to get these internal browning disorders. Um, Pre-harvest chemistries are going to be important, particularly when we start coming up to the harvest season. So anything that's a plant growth regulator um, that might have an impact on our fruit maturity. Uh, irrigation relates to tree stress. Um, tree stress will have an effect on internal browning. Tree age, younger trees tend to be a little punky, um, have fruit that tends to have a little bit more disorder going into storage, and then block history. Um, most of us will know or have blocks or areas of our blocks that just have a little bit higher incidence in browning. So knowing our block um, and knowing that fruit. Post-harvest factors, so it's those ones we've already covered in terms of the fruit physiology of disorders. So our storage atmosphere is really important, particularly the first couple of weeks, like we talked about, and our storage temperature. So both our rate of cooling and what our destination or final storage temperature is. And then these are both going to also interact with your storage duration. So the longer that fruit stays in storage, um, the higher that risk is of fruit developing browning. And then the complicated part is that all of these can cross relate with each other. Um, which is why I think we get to this next slide, which might be a little bit disappointing, um, but hopefully it makes sense as to, to why I've, I've put this here. Um, but, but there's no silver bullet, either for predicting the risk or for managing the risk, because there's just so many factors that are involved here. So in terms of predicting, um, I believe seasonal climate is, is a good tool to get you in the ballpark. So it's going to help you find out whether you're in that sort of low, moderate or high risk but it's not the only thing that you should be looking at and you shouldn't be looking at it sort of in isolation. You need to also consider some of those other pre-harvest factors that, that we've talked about there. And again, on the post-harvest side, so there's nothing um, that's going to um, be a complete control or a complete management tool. If we know we're in a moderate or a high risk season, then it really is about managing all those things um, the best we can, both pre-harvest and post-harvest, to try and keep us at the bottom end of that risk category as much as we possibly can. So when we start talking now about this season, um, climate is gonna be our best tool to kind of figure out where we are in terms of what we're expecting to see in the current and in the coming year. So the tool that we use for, for developing that is the, the growing degree days above 10 um, in your orchard. So these are the calculations here. Um, in terms of what they mean, um, they are very straightforward, but it can be a little bit um, overwhelming or confusing. Um, so what you're going to do is find your closest bomb station, um, or if you have your own weather station in your orchard, um, you can use the data from that as well. That's gonna give you a, a more accurate read. Um, but again, I think climate's useful, but don't get too caught up in the details because it's not the only thing. And we need to take into account all of our other factors that we have going on as well. So once you've got some climate data, then you're going to work out your date of full bloom. Again, if it's off by a week or two, that's not going to significantly change your model. Then we're going to calculate our daily average temperature, which is what this top um, equation here is, which is you take your maximum temperature plus your minimum temperature, divide them by two, and then we subtract our base. Um, our base for this model is 10 degrees. Um, if your average daily temperature is below 10, we just change it to a zero. So we don't have negative accumulation in the model. And then you add all of your daily temperatures together from your date of full bloom to your date of harvest. And that gives you your total seasonal growing degree days. Um, if you don't have your own weather station and you want to use bomb data, uh, Rose found this great resource. The website was really long and convoluted. So I turned it into a, a tiny URL. Um, so Queensland DAF um, have a nice website. So if you go to tinyurl.com slash apple GDD, um, there's a really nice website there where you can select your region. They even have a nice map. So you can pick the bomb station that's closest to you. Um, and you can put in your dates and it will tell you your, your growing degree days for the season that you select. And you can go back historically um, as well and look at the data. Um, I'm sure Rose and I can, can put together a, a quick guide for, for how to use that site if that's um, of interest. So this is some growing degree day data um, for Australia. This isn't the current season. Um, I just wanted to put this here to, to illustrate a couple of points. Um, so the first point is we have a lot of variation in Australia across our apple growing regions. So, so we range from sort of around that 800 
So this is from full bloom to harvest. So full bloom around about October, harvest around about April. Um, we range from around 800 to 1800. It's a really big spread um, of what we see in Australia. So, so that's one thing to keep in mind is that this is why we can have big variation region to region. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to point out here is that most of our accumulation is happening here over the summer and early autumn. So that's why I'm saying if you don't know your exact date of full bloom, if you're out by a week or two or three, we don't see a lot of accumulation down here. So just make your best guess. It's really not going to change the model. And same thing with your harvest date. We don't see in most of our regions much accumulation of temperature in these last couple of weeks. So make your best guess, especially if you're looking back at historical data of your harvest date and you're going to be in the right zone. Most of our accumulation, you're going to be in this mid range. Um, so your model should be relatively good, even if you don't know exactly what your date of full bloom or your date of harvest were. So this is looking at our apple growing regions in Australia um, over the last couple of years and this year sort of to date, so to Monday of this week. But again, we don't expect to see too much accumulation over the next few weeks. We will see a bit. Um, so this number um, on the end here will get a little bit higher. So we'll talk about some of this. Um, the good or bad news is that this is relatively, um, a lot of the outcomes of this, I guess, are relatively common across regions. So if you find um, your most sort of descriptive region along here, um, and you look at yours, it doesn't sort of matter which one I'm talking about because our trends are all relatively similar across the regions. So the first thing to keep in mind is that we have to sort of split our data into our two different types of browning. Our warmer regions generally see this radial type of browning and our cooler regions generally see this diffuse type of browning. Now, for us in Australia, typically we're talking Southern Tassie or the Huon Valley um, is where we're gonna see that diffuse type. Now this, I've drawn a line here and it looks nice as a nice flat line it is sort of a zone um, and you can get diffuse browning sort of creeping up into these zones. You can get radial browning creeping down. It's not a really nice kind of flip the switch. You get one disorder or the other. We can see both, but generally we're talking cold for the diffuse type and sort of moderate to hot regions. We're talking about the radial type of browning. So once we know the type of browning, the other thing we keep in mind is the risk. So if we talk about the diffuse type, um, as we get colder in our cold region, our risk goes up. So the warmer we are in a cool region, the lower risk we have. But when we have cool seasons in a cool region, we have an even higher risk. And then the opposite is true for the radial type. So the warmer we get in a radial region, the lower our risk is. So we have decreasing risk as we go away from this line and then increasing risk as we go away from the line in, in this direction. So now when we look at one of our regions, so let's look at the Golden Valley. Um, we have data from 2018, 19, 2021, and then this year, which we do expect to grow a little bit. But what our sort of takeaway message from here and hopefully it was sort of what your general experience has been, is that 2018 and 19 were probably relatively good years. We had nice accumulation of growing degree days. So we were probably at low risk across most of these regions um, for internal browning in those years. When we look at 2020 and 2021, so last year and the year before, here we've had much cooler seasons pretty much across the board, except maybe um, West Australia, um, had some warmer weather in, in 2020. But what that means is that those last two years had a higher risk than the previous two years. So this is probably why we started seeing more internal browning showing up last year and the year before compared to our previous years. Then the look ahead for this season, unfortunately what it's looking like, and again, relatively across the board, is that this year is going to be similar to last year, if not higher risk again. So we do expect some more accumulation. We're probably not gonna get back to 2021 levels, say in um, the Golden Valley. If I look at Yarra Valley, we're probably gonna be pretty much the same as where we were last year or the year before. 
Um, Huon Valley looks like it's going to be pretty similar to the last two years, um, but a lot of our other regions, we're going, we're looking like we're going to be at a higher risk um, than we even saw last year. So now that we know um, we're heading into a season that, that has some risk, uh, now we need to start looking at what can we do about it. So in terms of maturity and storage, um, there's not a whole lot we can do about the pre-harvest side now. Um, that information is, is great as, as background. It's also good to know for, for how we manage our crops moving forward. Um, but at this point in time, there's not too much we can do on, on the orchard side. It's about how we're gonna manage this fruit once it comes into the post-harvest or storage environment. So maturity is gonna be really important. Um, making sure that we're, we're harvesting our fruit at the right starch. Um, we've got firm fruit going into storage. Cooling, very important. We do wanna make sure that we're stepwise cooling. Um, a typical stepwise cooling would be loading a room around about five. Then you reduce the temperature by a half to one degree per week at the fastest. You can go quite a bit slower than this. Um, and you want your final destination to be about one or two degrees if you're in mainland Australia and you're talking about that radial browning risk. You do want to keep your destination temperature a little bit warmer um, if we're looking at a risk of diffuse flesh browning. So diffuse flesh browning, we do want to keep that final temperature a bit warmer than that, probably around about the three degrees. Controlled atmosphere is the other thing we want to be really conscious of. So our standard um, sort of recipe for long-term storage is going to be 2% oxygen, 1% CO2. But we do want to make sure that CO2 is kept as low as possible during that first eight weeks of storage. So you want to be venting rooms, um, using scrubbers, using lime. At the very least, we want to be monitoring. Um, even in air storage rooms, uh, we can get CO2 levels that are quite high and we want to make sure that we're aware of those and, and keeping track of them. Um, in order to, to sort of reduce some of that risk a little bit more, it is fairly common to delay establishment of CA as well. So just making sure that you're not bringing oxygen down because that's going to increase our risk um, in that first six to eight weeks. So sort of get your cooling under control once cooling sort of nice and calm down then start applying your, your CA. You don't need to rush into CA with a pink lady. It's a nice firm apple. It's not gonna lose a, a lot of condition. It doesn't need to go into to rapid CA. So that's our sort of optimal situation. Um, but then we wanna talk a little bit about what happens when we need to compromise our optimal situation because you know, reality is it's not gonna be optimal. So, so what can we do? Especially knowing that we're going into a season that has a little bit more risk than some of our previous seasons. So when we're trying to manage a variety for an internal browning disorder, we can end up in this compromise between quality and managing the disorder. So we want to keep the temperature a little bit warmer so that we can prevent the disorder. Well, but by keeping our temperature a little bit warmer, now we're managing our, our quality because we can't keep our fruit for as long if we're keeping our fruit at a warmer temperature. So these are all these compromises that we need to be considering when we're managing how we put this fruit into storage. So from a pre-harvest side, like I said, we've only got a couple of weeks now until harvest. So there's not too much we can do on the harvest side. It is all gonna be about managing maturity. We need to make sure that we're not getting fruit that's over mature because that's gonna put us into that senescent browning risk. When we already know we have a risk, it's gonna push us a little bit higher into that ballpark of risk if we're not managing maturity. So make sure you're checking fruit, checking starches. Don't just wait until you sort of predicted um, harvest to start checking fruit. Make sure that you're out there checking starches and, and seeing how maturity is going. Um, you can use plant growth regulators, so if we're talking about harvester, to hold maturity. So if you need to get around a weather or labor event, we do want to make sure that we're getting that fruit off at the best maturity that we can for long-term storage. Um, we also want to get consistent fruit in bins. So Pink Lady is not a variety that we can typically strip pick. We do want to get multiple picks, and that's to try and get consistent fruit in the bin. The more consistent we can have the fruit in the bin in the storeroom, the more consistently we can manage that fruit in the post-harvest environment and know what our expectations are going to be when we open that room. So that's pre-harvest. It's really all about the maturity. When we talk about the post-harvest side of things, so again, it's going to be really down to temperature management and CO2 management making sure we're not rapid cooling that fruit and making sure we're not going into a rapid CA either. With pink ladies, it's really gonna be sort of about low and slow. We can cool them down slowly and we can slowly go into CA. We don't wanna rush the fruit. That's going to increase our risk for the development of disorders. 
The other piece of the post harbor side is really about inventory management. So if you know you have blocks that maybe have a little bit more advanced maturity um, or they're from areas of your orchard that are a little bit more stressed or have more of a history of internal browning, if we can try and manage that inventory to make sure that those fruit don't go into your long-term storage because time is your other factor in this. If we know that fruit has a risk, um, we don't want that fruit to go into long-term store because that's where we're more likely to see these disorders developing. So this is the last slide. It's just a bit of a, a summary of that for you. So again, with Pink Lady Browning, um, we've got three different disorders that we're managing. Um, the diffuse type for us in Australia, it's mostly going to be um, Southern Tassie. That's a chilling injury. But again, we can see this in, in Southern parts of Australia as well. Um, tends to occur in cool regions. We want to manage maturity as best we can. We want our destination temperature to be a bit warmer. So around about three degrees. And we want to make sure we're keeping our CO2 as low as possible. Um, and certainly we don't want to be going above 1%. That radial type of browning is a senescent type breakdown, but it's also very influenced by CO2. It's going to occur in our warmer regions. Um, we, again, managing maturity is really key. Stepwise cooling is important. Um, and for this type of browning, we don't want to go below one. Knowing that this season's got um, a higher risk than what we've seen recently, um, I'd probably be more comfortable at sort of a 1.5 or a 2. Um, and again, we want to manage our CO2. Um, CO2 injury, it's just a straightforward CO2 injury. We just manage it the same way we would any other CO2 injury, which is, again, managing maturity um, and managing our CO2 to make sure that we're not um, exceeding our thresholds. So I know that's a lot of information and I know I, I can talk very quickly. So please feel free to, to get in touch um, if you have uh, questions that we don't run through today. Mm -hmm.